thank you so much for joining us this afternoon, everyone. It's my great pleasure to be joined by Tom Parfit. My name's Anne Morgan. Uh, I'm the author of Reading the World. I love reading uh, uh, about international storytelling. And I was really, really gripped by Tom's book. Tom's book, uh, High Caucasus, a mount no, I need to get this right, A Mountain Quest in Russia's Haunted Hinterland. That's right. Really gripping <coughs> title in itself. Um, it tells the story of an epic walk that you did from the Black Sea, Sochi and the Black Sea and the Black Sea coast, uh, over to Durban uh, and the Caspian Sea, a thousand miles through the Caucasus Mountains, including many territories that are declared no-go zones by the Foreign and Commonwealth Office. Um, Tom, I wonder if we could start by you telling us what led to this book. What was the background to this extraordinary journey? Absolutely, yeah. So I, I worked as a, a, a correspondent for British newspapers in Russia for 20 years, from 2002 to 2022. And uh, in the early years when I was working in Russia, I was working quite a lot in the North Caucasus region. Some of you remember, may remember those especially well-known republics like Chechnya and Dagestan in Ingushetia. There had been a war for independence, two wars for independence in Chechnya, and then there, there was a kind of Islamist insurgency which spread out across the whole region. Uh, so I was reporting on that often, traveling there from Moscow. And then in 2004, I was a reporter at the Beslan school siege, another thing you might remember when more than a thousand uh, children and their parents and teachers were held hostage in a school by uh, Chechen and English militants in the, in the Christian Republic of North Ossetia in, in the North Caucasus region, which is in southern Russia. Uh, so that was, um, and, and, and actually quite by chance, just arriving here today, you know, we talk about travel. The best thing about travel is serendipity, isn't it? I, just at the entrance to the centre today, I bumped into my friend Julius Strauss. We were reporting together as colleagues at the Best Land School Siege in 2004, and we completely by chance just met outside. Um, so I'm very glad to see him. He's a figure in the first chapter of my book and, you know, a significant person for me. It was a lovely surprise. But it, it was for both of us, I think, <clears throat> and for many other reporters with, who were there, you know, a, a traumatic experience. Of course, it's a thousand times worse for anyone who's personally involved, who was a relative of someone who was killed. 300 odd people were killed at the end of the siege, more than half of them children. About, I think, 178 children were killed in the explosions and the shooting and the fire which uh, broke out at the end of this terrible siege. Uh, so, yeah, quite obviously it's awful for the, for the people whose relatives died, for those who survived and were deeply traumatized, but it's also a pretty deeply unpleasant thing for a reporter. And after reporting there, I had a, re a recurring nightmare for several years about seeing a woman outside the school being told that her child had been killed and she was falling to the ground in despair. And this was something which came back to me in my dreams for several years. Uh, so after about four years, when this was still happening occasionally, this dream coming back, I struck on the idea of attempting a walk across the region. I had done quite a lot of walking in my university years in Eastern Europe, um, camping out wild and so on. And I thought that this might be basically a way of, on the one hand, sort of coming to terms with what I'd seen at Bislan, um, trying to sort of dilute it by seeing another side of the Caucasus, but at the same time to sort of try and drill down and understand what was the soil from which this violence had sprouted? Mm. What, why had this land happened? And what could people, what could drive people to behave in that desperate fashion? Yeah, now, as I mentioned, a, a number of the territories, a number of the regions that you worked, walked through were really, on paper at least, quite dangerous. There were a lot of threats. <coughs> uh, there, the advice was not to go there. Um, what, how much consideration did you give that? And, and why did you decide to take that risk? I mean, obviously, a lot of consideration. I did, you know, study the situation very carefully, try to understand which were the hotspot areas where uh, there might be uh, Islamist violence or skirmishes between the Russian security forces and the militants. Um, but I think I had a, having been, traveled there a lot and experienced incredible hospitality there and kindness and knowing that there were many people who were of complete sound mind, there would be no problem associating with them, staying with them, you know, I had a feeling that it was a calculated risk mm -hmm. and that I could do my best to 
you know, minimise being in completely the wrong place at the wrong time. You did, however, but walk into a war at one point, didn't you? Can you tell us a Effectively, it did, yes. Because yeah. I, in the middle of the walk, I had... So basically, if you can imagine, uh, this is the Black Sea here, and this is the Caspian, this is Russia here, we're in southern Russia, and the spine of the North Caucasus, the Greater Caucasus Mountains, connects the two seas. And I was walking on the northern flanks entirely inside Russia. On the southern side is Georgia and Azerbaijan, two former Soviet states. And it just so happened that when I reached the sort of middle of the North Caucasus between the two seas, that the war broke out in South Ossetia, which is across the mountains. On the other side, a breakaway Republic of Georgia, which is supported by Russia. And uh, I had just walked into Vladikavkaz, the main town just on the other side of the mountains. So, and uh, various um, militia men from all over the Caucasus were gathering Cossacks, uh, irregular troops, to travel through the tunnel under the mountains and go and join the war in, in uh, South Ossetia. So suddenly I was effectively on the edge of this war. Yeah, mm -hmm. and I, I, in the end I did actually take a break and return to my reporting job for several weeks mm -hmm. uh, before going back to the walk. So that was quite a strange experience because I was mm -hmm. sort of clumping around in my walking boots and uh, with my dusty trousers and all my colleagues had come from Moscow <laughs> and I was this sort of sun blackened figure who just turned up from the mountains. Yeah. Uh, and uh, you were also interrogated a couple of times by various officials, weren't you, um, uh, about your reasons for, <coughs> for being in certain places and your paperwork. Um, That's true, And a, yeah. a few quite concerning moments, sometime where you thought, um, firstly in Abkhazia, yeah. I think, early in the trip, where you took a detour and uh, found yourself wondering if you might get out of the hotel where you were sort of required to stay in order to return and be not knowing if you ever might you, you might really have got stuck there for some time that's true yeah i mean um th there is a uh, that was in another breakaway part of georgia a uh, war was breaking out with georgia proper between this breakaway region of Kaiser and the rest of the country and georgia is effectively backed by the west so when i was walking in abkhazia which is which is backed by russia on by co on contrast there was a sort of suspicion that I was a fifth columnist for, for Westerners who were trying to help Georgia and that I'd come to spy on Abkhazia. Mm. Um, and, you know, to be perfectly fair, in the 19th century, there were uh, British adventurers who went to the Caucasus and who were pretty much in all but name kind of agents of British power. So there is the kind of historical suspicion of people coming and, you know, I was sponsored by the Royal Geographical Society. You know, things like that in Russia are seen as fronts for intelligence, basically, mm. <laughs> going back historically. And there may be an, uh, an element of truth in that, mm. historically. And, I mean, history plays a big part in this book because this is a turbulent region now, but it was a, has been a turbulent region across the centuries. And something that comes through really strongly in your book is the, the level of trauma that many people living in this region, many of their um, ancestors and, and recent generations have experienced deportation and being uprooted from homes being a recurring theme. Can you tell That's us a little true. bit about <coughs> some, of those, some of those areas that you came to, perhaps pick out one that, that stands out for you? As yeah, of course. I mean, um, so, th so the North Caucasus is this, this incredibly rich and varied region. It's not actually that big. It's probably only four or 500 miles between the Caspian and the Black Sea. Uh, but there are dozens of different small nationalities living there. Some of the main ones, as we were saying, Chechens, English, Balkars, Karachais. Um, very varied, but most of them Muslim, apart from the Ossetians. And Russia conquered this region in the 19th century during the, uh, the Caucasian War, which went on for 40 or 50 years. And uh, the Muslim Highlanders gave up, gave a, a, a great battle against the enormous Russian Tsarist military machine, but eventually lost. And at the end of that war, um, a huge number of Circassian people from the Northwest Caucasus were deported, were basically sent away to Turkey under terrible conditions, with many thousands of them dying on, on boats. Um, it, was a fa it was basically a kind of ethnic cleansing on a massive scale. And, and I have to say, you capture this so beautifully in your writings. You really get to the humanity of the experience. You, you imagine um, what it must have been like to leave the animals. You imagine the, the farmer going to the stall for the last time and seeing the, the favourite horse. 
an, an yes, awful indeed. Way. In fact, uh, that, in that instance, I was talking about a later wave of the deportations, Absolutely which was in the Second time. World yeah. War. Yeah. Yeah. So there was a, 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 almost a kind of repetition when entire nations in the North Caucasus were deported by Stalin because he suspected that they'd um, worked together with the invading Nazis, mm -hmm. that they'd collaborated. And that, there was a very small amount of that, but it was uh, the, the entire nations were punished. So they were loaded onto trucks and taken away, hundreds of thousands of people, everyone in these republics, and sent off to Central Asia in cattle wagons. Mm. Um, and you know that was incredibly long, dangerous journey. People died in the carriages, were thrown out, their bodies and so on. Um, and so that was you know, an incredibly distressing moment in the history of these small nations. Mm. And you certainly feel that those traumas from the past, the 19th century, the deportations during the Second World War, the terrible treatment of people during the wars in Chechnya in the 1990s, that they kind of reverberate down the centuries. And it has a very long sort of uh, long lasting pernicious effect, which still is felt today. And that is the, the source of the haunted, the word haunted really, isn't it? In the title of your book, it's this sense of these, these exactly, past yeah. traumas, these past. Um, yeah, I think that, I mean, obviously no place is without history, is it? But there are some places where you feel the shadow of history is cast a lot deeper and I think the Caucasus is one of those, definitely. What role do you feel as, as an outsider, as someone walking through a region like that, where there are these things that people have suffered, many in living memory, many going on now, uh, what role, what, what are the responsibilities that you have as, as a visitor to an area like that? That's a good question. I mean, the Caucasus has always been, even for Russians, so Russia conquered the region, and in many ways it, it saw the people there as, as savages, but it did see them often also as noble savages. So they were seen to be poorly educated Philistines in a way, but also they had, you know, terrific romantic clothes. They had great weapons. They were brilliant at fighting. Um, and the Cossacks, who were the kind of tip of the spear of the Russian advance, in many ways they copied the Highlanders who were there enemies, you know, the, the, the clothes that Cossacks wore are direct copies of Highland attire and they bought their weapons from the people who they were fighting mm. <laughs> because they were so much better. Um, so there's a very interesting kind of love-hate relationship mm. there. And, you know, the Russian writers who went there to write about it were also very attracted by it as well as being in some respects repelled. You talk about so Tol Tolstoy's um, I I visiting the hot springs. He used to visit the hot springs at one point, didn't he? That's and right, yeah, and this is the sort of thing that you can fall into yourself as yeah. a foreigner from outside the region. You have to be a bit careful of that, I think, because yeah. there are all these kind of romantic tropes associated with the place. But on the other hand, you know, we all know that uh, there are wonderful, alluring places in the world and they are interesting to us in that way and, you know, exotic, if you like, however troublesome that word is, mm. you know, so there is, a, there's, you know, y you kind of enter into that game of push and pull as well yourself as a foreigner, even from outside the region when you go there. Yeah. I mean, you, you get across the physical sense, not just of these historic traumas, but also your own experience. You say in the book that part of what you wanted to achieve with this walk was to return to your childhood life of the senses. And you really describe the smells and the experience, mm -hmm. the physical mm -hmm. experience, sometimes really uncomfortable, not being able to wash for a long stretch of time, and, and the food and the drink and, and getting roaring drunk with a number of the people you meet. Because I mean, that's the other thing. Uh, these regions are said to be very dangerous, and you did encounter some threats, but you encountered a huge amount of hospitality, didn't you? I Dagestan, yeah. in particular, you were told, oh, just go to the head of the village and, and say you need somewhere to stay, and you'll be put up. And you found that to be the case, actually. That's true, yeah. And uh, as you say, about the landscape, I mean, that very much fits with the idea, first of all, of it being a kind of a arena for noble adventure. You know, if you're Leo Tolstoy, who's a count, you, you don't actually need to go to war. You go there because you want to sort of kill the ennui of hanging around playing cards on your estate, you know. So, um, yeah, but it, I've lost, lost track there a little bit, but... The, the hospitality is... Yes, exactly, yeah, and that's also very much part of it, the fact that, um, um, you know, these same people were seen as noble savages who mm. would supposedly stick a knife in you, but at the same time, they would always invite you into their home and be um, very welcoming with food. Yeah. delicious food, you could stay the night. Uh, so that was all part of the 
Uh, I mean, it's extraordinary well. when you think about it. The way you write, it's, it's beautiful and it's, it's, it's gripping. But actually, I was thinking, you know, if someone were to appear on, on my road, would I just take them in out of nowhere? I mean, it's so... I think it's not very common in British culture for that to be that you welcome the stranger in that way. But there, it's, it's a, a source of pride. It's a source of... Absolutely, yeah. It's, it's absolutely sacrosanct, even mm. to the extent that the idea is that... Um, you know, even if your enemy comes to your house, then you have to welcome him. Mm. But there is a kind of bubble of hospitality and security around that person that cannot be broken. And there's some really extraordinary characters. I mean, you met this, this monk who was a former gangster of early in the trip, who um, mm -hmm. showed you around at the monastery, didn't you? Yeah. I mean, could you tell us a bit about him? He was a real Yeah, character. he was a pretty extraordinary character. So yeah. this is when I was walking through Abkhazia. This is a side trip at the beginning of the journey where I went into the breakaway Republic of Abkhazia in Georgia, and I stopped at the, uh, the Norve Afon Monastery, mm. which is a monastery set up by Russian monks who had to leave uh, Athos in Greece because, because of some disagreement. So they set up new Athos in Abkhazia in the 19th century. And I, I stopped off there and asked if it would be possible to stay at the monastery because I'd like to learn a bit more about it. And I was presented to a man who's called Father Fiofan, and um, he quite freely admitted that he was actually a former sort of fraudster who got into crime and decided to change his life and become, a, become a, an orthodox monk. And um, but he was also a fan of British pop music. So we had some quite surreal conversations about that. I don't know if many of you remember, there used to be a group called E17 <laughs> back in the 90s. And... Uh, yeah, he was really into them. And at some <laughs> point he said, um, oh, and I know that you've got criminal areas in Britain as well. And I said, oh, yeah, where, well, where's that then? And he said, E17, just like the group. <laughs> I, just, I was like, oh, Walthamstow? And he said, ah, oh, is that what it's called? And he sort of walked away muttering contentedly to himself, Walthamstow, Walthamstow. <laughs> So, uh, yeah, that he, was, he, was, he was a very amusing yeah. and he had some alarming ideas from my point of view in terms of being a terrible homophobe, you know, a sort of Russian chauvinist nationalist, basically. Um, but as often happens when you're traveling, you meet people who are complex, don't you? They have, you know, reprehensible ideas, but they're also kind of charming people. So you have to kind of deal with that. That's an interesting part of yeah. travel. And, and you encountered some interesting ideas about the UK as well, didn't you? I mean, someone told you they thought the UK was sinking. Um, oh, that's right. And, yeah. and also Foggy Albion, you, d you, you encountered. That's as an right. Idea. Yeah, I met someone in a village when I was walking and I said, oh, you're poor England. I'm so sorry that it's going to sink. <laughs> and I said, what, what do you mean? And Later, I found out there had been a documentary on Russian state television saying that um, Britain bombed Serbia in the late 90s because uh, it, would need, it wanted to try and get new territory because of climate change would mean that Britain would eventually go under the water and we would need a new place to live. So, <laughs> so <laughs> that was the story about why this woman was so sympathetic but then there about was my country people, sinking. Yeah, there are yeah, other people who were thinking the English might come and, and take charge at some point, that there was an idea that they might come and restore order of some kind. That's true. There is a, there's certain myths in the North mm. Caucasus about the fact that one day um, um, English adventurers or horsemen will come and they'll establish order and everything would be better in the North Caucasus. And you were seen as possibly a harbinger of this. In a, in a way. <laughs> I mean, jokingly, people have sort of suggested that, yeah. And there are also some quite fanciful ideas about, you know, English people going on the Crusades and getting lost in the mountains and staying behind. Mm. You know, some people even think uh, that English are called English because it's a bit like English, you know. Because ah. <laughs> it's all quite fanciful, really. Wow. But in a way, it's quite nice when you're there to feel it. Feel, people have this feeling of affinity with you. Yeah. Yeah. Now, memory is, is a topic that comes up repeatedly. And mm. you talk about um, the Memorialski. Um, and uh, can you tell us about, about them and, and, and their work, the, the memorial, yeah. the Greek? Yeah, sure. So that was one reason I became very beguiled with the Caucasus, because I used to go there and, and work quite closely with people from a human rights group, group called Memorial, which you may have heard of, most famous Russian human rights group, which... Uh, records Stalinist crimes, but also modern day human rights violations. So they're a very active um, group of 
human rights defenders working in Ingushetia next to Chechnya and recording all the transgressions of the Russian security forces who are very often kidnapping or uh, extrajudicially killing suspected militants. So I came to, well, I came to sort of know and love these, these activists from this human rights group memorial and they helped me a great deal. And the, one of their offices based near the three idiots in Grozny, is that's that right? right yeah. Exactly, yeah. yeah. That's the statue of three Soviet heroes, which is known by everyone locally as the three idiots. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, and I did also come to know a little a little bit um, uh, one particular um, human rights activist there called Natasha Estimirova. You may have heard of her, um, who was who was later very sadly murdered, mm. basically for her work. Now, memory, the, the question of what, how useful memory is, um, whether it's useful to forget certain things, whether certain things should be remembered, what role, how we should appro approach these traumas is, is a key theme in the book, and it's something you discuss and unpack. The book itself is an act of memory, because the walk, you undertook that 15, more than 15 years before you wrote the book, mm, and mm. I was wondering how, how you managed to reconstruct that memory in writing. And, and how, how, what role remembering played in creating it. That's true. I was lucky that I'd actually written quite a lot, several uh, chapters or first drafts of chapters quite soon after the walk, and then I'd had to put it aside because I couldn't find a publisher immediately. And then the idea of the book went through several iterations where I wanted to make it part of a bigger book about Russia, and then I returned to the idea of making it only about the Caucasus. So I was lucky to, to have those first drafts, and I do have... 15 notebooks. I, I kept a daily proper diary. Okay. So that was very helpful because I, a lot of it would have just gone yeah. t 10, 12 years later when I started writing in earnest. Um, but I, I do think uh, the period of time that elapsed helped a lot to, because it, you don't always realize when you're making a journey why you're doing it really or what the point of it is. It only becomes apparent to you later when you really think about it. What, what was it that you were trying to achieve and that helped a lot, I guess, having more than a decade in between to look back and to reflect on that and think what was, what was the significance. And then you begin to understand what's extraneous and what you've already written and what, what can be honed mm. and, and so on. You're very clear in the book that you, you, don't, you don't claim to have had PTSD after Beslan. You say you, you saw a journalist, who, you knew journalists who had had PTSD from certain yeah, things, sure. and that wasn't you. But there was trauma there that you wanted to, to work through through as part of this this journey we know this is a very delicate thing right yeah. because you, you, if you go as a reporter to somewhere like Bislan where something absolutely monstrous happens and it obviously happens in huge part to the people who suffered directly you know to then stand up and talk about my trauma you've got to be a bit careful here really you know it was a very distressing thing for me but it was absolutely nothing what it was like for people who are there and it's not as bad as I know it has been for colleagues who are reporters. I don't think Julius will mind me saying, he, you know, he had PTSD, didn't you, George? You've spoken about that, Julius, being in Sierra Leone and other places. And maybe part of what Julius did going to have his bear watching lodge in Canada was, was healing himself from that. Um, so yeah, it took a long while to come to terms with it, but you've got to keep it in proportion. Mm. Do you think the walk achieved that, that achieved that kind of maybe recalibration or, uh, um, adjusting your relationship to that, uh, to that experience? You're yeah, I think it did. I mean, I'm, I'm a bit suspicious generally of the idea of a nature cure. I think it's become a bit too much of a trope in, in sort of nature writing. Um, there's a lot of talk about that, isn't there? Mm. I think it works to some extent, definitely. I think it does. Um, but it may be dependent on the person. For me, I think what worked was walking as a kind of being outside and being there walking as a kind of method, as a way of meeting people, being forced to slow down. Being yeah, because walking itself, there's something special about walking, isn't it? The pace that, that I mean, there yeah. are proverbs in various languages about the heart travels at the pace of, of walking. Um, yes. And but I, I think I mean in terms of the way that it forces you to engage with people around right. you, because you can't hop in a car and go away. Yeah. You have to kind of engage with what's coming at you, the people you're meeting, you have to deal with it, you have to be sensitive, but you may also have to sort of use your guile a bit to get out of situations. I mean, you found but you're right there in the thick of it. And, yeah. and, and that was a way of doing that thing where I found out about a whole other 
side of the Caucasus, which I felt was very positive and people being very resilient despite what happened to them personally or their nation historically, mm. that people were, as I say in the book, both sort of literally and metaphorically living and thriving on stony ground mm. and that mm. they, were, they were going on, you know. Of stony ground, but incredibly beautiful ground. I mean, the, yeah, absolutely. It, that again, something that comes through in the book is how <coughs> extraordinary this landscape is. The mountains. I mean, we we think of Mont Blanc as being, you know, the highest mountain in Europe, or you know, but actually, it's dwarfed by a number of peaks in the High Caucasus, isn't it? That's true. Yeah. And, and it really comes across your writing about the landscape. It's really beautiful. How how did you go about capturing that on the page? Something so sublime and so awe-inspiring. That's difficult, isn't it? What can you do? I mean, I did, there was one moment where I was sort of on the shoulder of Elbrus, the very high mountain. I'm not a mountaineer, but so it was very exhilarating to be so high up without even being on the peak, on, on the summit. And that was just literally mind-blowing, you know, just to see this great sea of peaks, you know, um, as if they were kind of like a choppy water sort of thrusting the peaks up towards these fluffy clouds. And, you know, there were the ice falls of Elbrus kind of coruscating in the light. I mean, there were just some moments where, yeah, all you have to do is describe what you're seeing because it's so self-evidently sublime. Mm. And, I mean, it also you encountered some incredibly beautiful, or picturesque, I mean, that's my, my Western bias coming across, but um, l livelihoods, the shepherds, I mean, hard lives, but the beautiful in their purity in a way as, at, at, the, at the same time there's a certain kind of you say that there's a sense of connecting down the centuries when you see a shepherd crouching with their f face lit with firelight you know it's, it's almost that that livelihood has really not changed yeah um, yeah absolutely and again I, I wouldn't want to over romanticize it but it's more like just a sheer admiration for yeah. the uh, for the Spartan manner of that lifestyle for the how people survive doing that these are shepherds who live in the high mountains in north caucasus they live in little stone or wooden shelters um for months on end um and you know we think of a shepherd as being a sort of you know soft sort of pastoral thing don't we almost and this is an incredibly hardy lifestyle you're living up there with your rifle trying to protect your sheep from lynxes and wolves um you know your your kosh, your little shelter gets knocked down by an avalanche every couple of years. Mm. Um, you might fall in a ravine, you might meet a bear. You know, this is not an easy life by any means. So I, I admire it very much in that, in that sense, yeah. yeah. Mm. And, and, and the, the, these uh, were men who helped me a great deal. That, mm. you know, they let me stay in their huts and told me wonderful stories. Mm. And wildlife was itself a challenge, wasn't it? That you had, at one point, uh, what you thought was going to be a rather scary encounter with a bear, but it turned out not to be quite what you, what you thought. But it, you did have to be prepared that there might be attacks from wild animals. That's true. The, 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 the near encounter with a bear was, was in my tent, hearing something scratching around, but then eventually realising it was my stubble rubbing on my sleeping bag. <laughs> uh, so it wasn't quite what I thought. But I did end up meeting a wild boar in the forest. That actually sounds quite banal now, doesn't it? Because it happens everywhere in Europe, including Britain. <laughs> but, um, <laughs> but it was quite a scary moment, meeting a wild boar sort of face to face a few meters away and not being sure whether it was going to charge me. And having earlier met a poacher in Abkhazia, it showed me this wound in his dog's side. It had this great gash in its side where you could see the muscle rippling in the bottom of it. And he said, um, a wild boar ch charged him. They don't like it when you surprise them. So I had just surprised this wild boar, <laughs> and I had this thought in my mind about the poor dog. Anyway, so I, just like a coward, I ended up just running away, which is probably exactly the wrong thing to do. <laughs> but fortunately, it didn't come after me, so, so yeah. it's okay, yeah. Yeah. I mean, it is, it is a wonderful, extraordinary journey. I, I'm a conscious we have a number of uh, travelers in the audience, so I was wondering if anyone is planning an epic walk of some description, whether that be through mountains or, or other terrain. Uh, do you have any top tips for, for how you might, things to bear in mind or things to, to take note of to prepare? What would you, because yeah. you obviously can't carry not, much, so what do you need to take? Yeah, that's a um, good question. I'm not sure I'm entirely the right person to answer it, because I turned out to be quite a sort of incompetent walker <laughs> myself. 
But I mean, I, I do think it's a hugely important to just get hold of people who know the lay of the land before mm -hmm. you go, you know, if you can. It can give you some idea about how much, you know, what's the snow line? It, will a pass likely be blocked in certain weather? You know, is there a place where you're at danger of a landslide? Um, and that's how the shepherds helped a lot along the way. So, you know, always be open to local knowledge, you know, because your guidebook might be four or five years out of date. Yeah. And, you know, glaciers change quickly these days, for example. So, sorry, there's a bit of a trite answer, really. No, no, I mean, but it's interesting because you did, you walked alone, but you were accompanied for long legs of the journey by certain people. Weren't that's you? true, Muzo yeah. is one who stands out in my mind, particularly. Well, sorry, he was yeah. incredibly, I mean, it, physically it was a real challenge for him, but he, he did, he went to the ends of the earth to, to carry on and to honour his promise to he see He did. Too. Poor Musa, he's the yeah. man who walked with me through Chechnya, but he turned out to be very unfit and had to go on a bicycle. And then in the end, he couldn't even do that, so he just drove in his car next to me. I kept stopping <laughs> and waiting for you to catch up. <laughs> so, <laughs> but that was kind of nice. I didn't want it to be like a sporting endeavour, you know. I'm not really interested in walking in that sense. I like the idea, as I've said, of walking as a method, you know, mm. and as a method of discovery. So these were guys who were... They were sort of guides, but they were equally people who didn't really know that much about the route either. We were kind of feeling our way together. But, you know, it's useful to have a, a local person with you to help smooth the way a little bit and to be sort of under their wing a little bit because there's very much the idea that if you're under the wing of somebody, um, you know, that that person is looking after you, then to make trouble for you is to make trouble for them. So it's a bigger, a mm. bigger mountain to climb to, yes. to rob you for example, yeah. Yeah. Um, and you know, and these, these people just have all the local knowledge. So yeah, that helped a great deal, yeah. How important was it to be able to speak Russian to do this journey? Pretty important, yeah. yeah. I mean, I, I'd been in uh, Russia six years then, so my Russian was pretty good, but not amazing, not totally brilliant. Um, but it does help, I mean, in Russia in general, outside big cities, not that many people speak English, so. Um, and, you know, despite having all the different cultures and languages in the North Caucasus, Russia is the lingua franca, you know, but it's, it is only, probably be only a small number of very rural people who don't speak Russian. Mm. So it's pretty much essential, to be honest. Now, this is a journey that you certainly couldn't do now. You're not able to, to no, go sadly, to Russia no. at the moment. How has that been, being cut off from a place that has been so central to so much of your life. Yeah, so I, had to, I left Russia in 2022, voluntarily, I have to say, but when it became already quite dangerous to be there for a reporter because they introduced new laws under which you can be prosecuted for writing about the special military operation in the wrong way, for example, even just calling it a war. Um, so, you know, it was obviously a pragmatic thing to do to leave Russia, but I also was very sad about it. I didn't really want to leave. My wife is Russian. She didn't want to go. Um, you know, despite all the heinous things being committed in Russia's name, I still love Russia very much, you know, and I think it's got uh, many things of great value there and, and wonderful people. Again, that sounds like a banal thing, but I mean to say that they're um, not everyone there is some gung-ho supporter of the war in Ukraine. Mm. You know, it's now a dictatorship, so it's extremely dangerous to be a dissenting voice, so a lot of people just have to be silent. Mm -hmm. But um, at least a very large minority of people are not happy about what's happening in Ukraine, for example. So mm -hmm. um, all of which to say is just, I, think, I still think it's a, you might su be surprised to hear, but I think it's a wonderful country. And, you know, I think it will rise again. Yeah. Well, we're going to open up to audience questions now. Does anyone have a burning question for Tom? We have a roving mic going around. Anyone like to ask anything? Yes, a hand over here. Um, hi, Tom. Uh, like hi. you, I have a Russian wife, and I oh. used to live in Russia, so I have family over there. Did you? Um, what are the practicalities or realities if I needed to go back to Russia to visit? Sorry, what are the, what are the pro practicalities? Yes. Yeah, and, the re and the reality of returning to Russia. How, how realistic <laughs> is it yeah. for someone to go back and visit? I wish I could say I think it would be fine, but I think you do have to be very cautious now, you know, because um, the situation around Ukraine is so antagonistic, and if you watch the Russian state TV, TV shows, Britain is really enemy number one even more than the United States. You know, you, you will 
constantly be bombarded information, Russian viewers are being bombarded information with, um, about perfidious Britain and its people and what it's trying to do by supporting Ukraine. So, um, and I think there's just the chance that you could go there and be caught up in some, you know, be accused of being a spy on the basis of absolutely nothing and you'll be used as a pawn in some prisoner swap for some Russian who's uh, abroad and you'll, you'll be there and for several years in prison. I, I, you know, that's obviously a worst case scenario. You may go there and it'll be fine. And I'd like to think that it would. Um, but I do think there's quite a high risk of that now, and sadly. And I don't know actually about getting a visa now. That could be quite difficult as well because there are tit, tit for tat now um, restrictions on getting visas. So that might be quite difficult as well. I very much hope that, you know, one day all of us who love Russia will be going back there, but I think it may be a bit early for now. Thank you. Any other questions for Tom? <laughs> yes, a hand here. Uh, you said that you had to leave because, as a journalist, you were worried about what would happen to you. But how come Steve Rosenberg manages to report almost nightly from Moscow uh, how come he's not stopped? Yeah, that's a very good question, which we all ask ourselves. And, you know, I'm a huge admirer of Steve. He's a brilliant reporter, and he's been very brave to stay there. And I think none of us really know the answer to that question. But I think that perhaps Steve has had a reputation for many, many years, because he worked in Russia for 25 years or so, as I remember, uh, or maybe even 30 over a couple of stints. He's always had a reputation of trying his very hardest to be even-handed and to put the official Russian side of the story to paint a nuanced picture of what's going on there. And I think perhaps he's just preserved some vestige of respect for that. And perhaps it's just, just the, 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 would be the biggest hurdle to climb to, pick out the, to kick out the BBC. That really would be, you know, it would really look terrible. I mean, it looks bad enough what's happened to other journalists, including foreign ones. But maybe they've just decided to allow Steve to stay. And um, he still, even now, tries his very hardest to be even-handed. So um, at least so there's one sort of uh, quite weighty figure from the, British, from the Western press there. They can say that they haven't kicked everyone out altogether, and they're still allowing some Western reporting. But it, it, you know, it is a mystery to us. But, uh, all credit to Steve, he's, a, he's an absolute true professional. Mm, yeah, very brave, yeah. Um, any, any other questions? <laughs> well, if you do, something does occur to you, um, Tom will be signing books at the table in the bookshop, just there, the, I can see already lovely piles of um, his wonderful book, and I would heartily recommend it. It is an incredibly absorbing read. It's such a fascinating journey, and he brings it to life so beautifully. Um, so really, I, I can't recommend it enough. Um, but for now, I'd ask you to join me in thanking Tom Parfit. Thank you very much. Thanks, Anne. Thanks very much. Pleasure.